Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in this part of the world. Welcome to this year's uh, Deep Wind Energy Wind Conference in Trondi, Norway. My name is John Kweko Amo Otu, and uh, my presentation title is DC Fall Protection and Clearing Strategy that is applicable to an MMC based uh, HVDC transmission system utilizing a hybrid DC circuit breaker. Next, I'll go through the agenda or outline of my presentation. And uh, first, I'll talk about uh, the current fault detection and processing techniques that we have out there and uh, the advantages and disadvantages, the current uh, fault processing schemes and the advantages and disadvantages. And I will talk about uh, the current uh, HVDC installations that we have out there. Next is uh, a test topology or schematic of the model uh, that was uh, part of my research. Next is uh, voltage source converters, MMC topology, and the DC fault characteristics as applicable to pole to ground fault and pole to pole faults. Next, we'll talk about the parameters uh, for the voltage source converter MMC that was utilized uh, for this uh, research. Then we'll pivot on the structured control of an MMC. MMC means modular multi-level converter. Next, we'll talk about the proposed protection and fault clearing strategies that we have over there. And uh, we'll look at uh, the fault clearing strategies that was utilized uh, for this research. And uh, that is the fully selective uh, fault clearing strategy. Then we'll talk about the proposed uh, fault detection strategy and uh, distinguishing between an internal and an external fault. As I continue with agenda or the outline, then we'll, we'll, I'll present uh, the way how the determination of uh, the fault location is uh, done. Then uh, for classification part, utilizing machine learning and algorithm. Next, I'll talk about uh, the backup fault protection schemes uh, that we are uh, utilizing, utilizing the AC side breakers of the MMC converters. Next, we'll talk about the feature extraction detailed coefficients and entropy as used in the fault detection process. Next, we'll talk about uh, the steady state simulations and uh, basically I'll show you, you know, uh, the parameters that were measured uh, during uh, the steady state uh, simulation as per design. Next, we'll see some simulations that justifies uh, the need uh, to utilize uh, a DC fault uh, clearing breaker to ensure that uh, faster fault clearing strategy is used, is implemented. Next, we'll talk about the PS card simulations uh, for DC faults. Then, identification and distribution of lightning disturbance. As you know, um, the MMC converter that is located onshore, you know, it's uh, located in an air insulated air, uh, substation. So, it, that one is prone to lightning disturbance. This lightning disturbance can corrupt steady state operations without causing a fault or uh, when it occurs it can uh, cause a fault so there has to be a way of distinguishing that and the last but not the least is uh, performance uh, validation and, uh, that uh, involves uh, basically building a sequence uh, and, uh, network and also create a logic scheme to achieve that Next, I'll talk about the current HVDC fault detection techniques that we, we have over there. The first one is our overcurrent uh, protection. That is a non-unit uh, based. Next is uh, under voltage. Uh, that also is a non-unit uh, based. A non-unit based means that it is uh, localized at one end of uh, the DC protection uh, scheme. Next is a uh, differential protection. For differential protection, it is a unit based. Uh, that is, uh, it has uh, uh, detection or protective relays that are located on both ends of the DC transmission system. And uh, it is used as a main protection scheme. Next, the rate of change of uh, voltage and rate of change of current. This is a non unit based and much more localized. 
Next is a traveling wave. Uh, and traveling wave can either be non-unit or unit-based. And uh, when it is uh, used as a unit-based, uh, it is used as a main protection scheme. We can also have a traveling wave current differential, which uh, likewise can be non-unit or unit-based. And when it is used as a unit-based, uh, it is used as a main protection scheme. Next down the slide, we'll talk about the advantages of the current APDC for, te uh, for detection techniques um, that we have over there. In the previous slide, I made mention of uh, the current APDC for detection schemes we have, but, but this slide, I'm going to talk about uh, the advantages of those uh, current uh, APDC for uh, detection schemes. They are very simple to um, implement, especially the overcurrent under voltage and uh, the rate of change and uh, rate of ch uh, change of uh, current and voltage. And matter of fact, the derivatives are very fast and high speed and also a very mature technology. It has been in um, commercial operations uh, for a long time and they are very effective. Also, the rate of change of current and the rate of change of voltage has some inherent selectivity in it. Next up is a traveling wave. Uh, you know, uh, one of uh, the best uh, um, advantages of a traveling wave, and uh, it's uh, it does not depend on the magnitude of the current. Even if the magnitude of the current is very small, it can generate a traveling wave. Now let's talk about the drawbacks with the current uh, APDC for detection techniques over there. It lacks the ability to detect uh, high impedance faults and arcing faults. And as you know, uh, even in AC uh, uh, networks, uh, we have arcing faults. When, and similarly, DC, for, uh, DC networks, uh, we have uh, high impedance and arcing faults. And these uh, schemes uh, lack the ability to detect uh, high impedance faults as such, uh, it makes them not reliable. Also, um, when a DC fault occurs, right, uh, the propagation of uh, the DC fault, uh, the traveling wave, uh, is influenced by transmission line and power systems uh, parameters. As you know, during faults, uh, uh, these uh, parameters are very dynamic and uh, they keep uh, changing until steady state uh, uh, operation is achieved. Also, there's, you know, a big challenge in detecting uh, high frequency components of uh, the fault current. And as you know, DC fault current has a, um, a lot of uh, high frequency components. So, utilizing uh, the current uh, fault uh, detection technique uh, uh, makes it very challenging. Next is uh, vulnerability uh, to um, influence of noise. As you know, you know, a, a protection system and a fault should happen. You know, sometimes a uh, background noise uh, that is uh, from, let's say if you have uh, an industrial facility that is uh, in closer proximity to where the location of uh, the fault detection uh, scheme is located, uh, it can influence uh, and basically um, uh, in terms of uh, the reliability of the uh, protection scheme, it can compromise that. Another source of noise is from the substation due to electromagnetic um, interference. Next, uh, these schemes uh, requires a high frequency sampling, you know, and a high frequency sampling basically translates into cost in terms of uh, basically um, commercialized building and commercializing a protective, a protective relay that can achieve that uh, high frequency uh, sampling. Next, it needs a time synchronized uh, measurement. That is, uh, it needs a uh, uh, global position systems, uh, you know, on both ends uh, that basically can timestamp uh, uh, the uh, fault uh, signal. Next uh, is attenuation. Attenuation uh, basically from the impedance uh, and um, the resistance of the transmission network uh, basically affect uh, the accuracy and um, basically um, attenuate uh, the traveling waves as fast as it can. So aside, it makes it uh, very difficult to locate uh, these faults. Next, uh, let's talk about 
the current uh, HBDC port processing schemes that we have out there. And that is from research and from literature. The first one is based on Fourier transform. And the second one is the short time Fourier transform. The next one is Hilbert one transformation. The next one is the S transform. And uh, the next one is a district uh, wavelet transform. And matter of fact, uh, for this uh, research, I utilize a district wavelet uh, transform. The next one is a continuous uh, wavelet transform. And artificial neural network, fuzzy logic uh, based, and uh, machine learning uh, schemes. Next, uh, let's talk about uh, the drawbacks with the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform can only process uh, fault information only in the frequency domain. It lacks the ability to process the fault in the time domain. And uh, the capability to process the fault both in the frequency and time domain is very crucial to correctly identify DC fault current. Now let's talk about the drawbacks with the short time Fourier transform. The short time Fourier transform, as you know, was introduced to mitigate some of the drawbacks that is associated with the Fourier transform. But more so, it also has its drawbacks. The reason being that it can process the false signal in time and frequency domain, but in a smaller and a fixed window. As such, it makes it very difficult to accommodate the dynamics of a DC4 current. It also requires more parameters and uh, introduces a, a computational burden. Now let's talk about uh, the drawbacks of the Hilbert Huang transformation. One of the drawbacks is it requires some more uh, parameters and as it requires some more parameters, it introduces a large computational burden that makes a uh, computation very long. Now, Let's talk about the advantages of uh, the district wavelet uh, transform, which is the pivot of this research. Which this is uh, the algorithm processing scheme that was utilized uh, to process the DC fault uh, signals that were uh, obtained from ps uh, simulation. The first one is it requires a, a fewer parameters. As such, it's computationally fast because it has a lower computational burden. It also has a fewer coefficients and less redundancy as compared to continuous wavelet transform that has more coefficients and more redundancy. Next is it's easier to perform the analysis utilizing discrete wavelet transform. Next time, let's go through the test topology or the model for the research, right? Okay, so a total offshore wind farm of 1.8 gigawatts uh, of wind energy and that has been grouped into two aggregated models. So the model, uh, each model was aggregated and uh, each wind turbine is rated at 5 megawatts and there are 180 units in each aggregated model. So a total of 900 megawatts for each wind farm. So wind farm one is 900 megawatts, wind farm two is 900 megawatts. These wind turbines are permanent magnet synchronous generator. And the reason why a permanent magnet synchronous generator was selected was because of its withstand uh, capability if uh, it is utilized in the offshore environment. It has the ability to uh, mitigate uh, maintenance uh, costs due to breakdown of the components as compared to a double fed induction generator. The output of this wind turbine is 690 volts. So internally, there is a step up transformer that step up the, tra uh, the voltage from 690 volts to a 66 kV AC collection voltage. The reason why 66 kV AC collection voltage was utilized is because of economics and also lower cost of maintenance. And matter of fact, uh, most of the offshore wind farms that are currently in installation or just began commercial operation 
all of them are pushing for a 66 kV AC collection bus instead of a 33 kV AC collection bus. The modeling for the wind turbine in the aggregated model was the average model. So from the 66 kV AC bus, the cable connection to the step-up transformer that steps the voltage from 66 kV to 230 kV transmission level. So there are two of them that is in parallel. The cable was model, uh, modeled in coupled pi configuration because of the short distance. So that cable, that 66 kV AC uh, cable goes to the low voltage side of this type of transformer. That is rated two of them in parallel for each wind farm. Each one is rated at 475 MVA and it steps the voltage from 66 kV to 230 kV with a, an impedance of 10%. To achieve a 230 kV AC bus. So from the 230 AC kV, uh, uh, kV AC bus, these are all located in an offshore substation platform. So the 230 kV AC bus is more of like a switch gear. It can be a GIS switch gear. From that, you have uh, the AC breaker, AC B3, right? That is on the AC side of the offshore MMC converter two. The offshore MMC converter two is rated at 2000 megawatts. So that converts uh, the AC voltage and AC power to the equivalent DC equ uh, voltage. So, it converts the 230 kV AC, AC voltage to 300 plus or minus 320 kV DC voltage. So, you have a pole to ground voltage of 320 kV and a pole to pole voltage of 640 kV. The length of the DC cable is 150 kilometers. And the DC cable is located, basically it's a submarine, subsea cable. So on this DC cable, various faults are applied to the entire, at various sections throughout the whole entire of the DC cable. A fault is applied at zero kilometers. So that is right at the terminal of MMC2, the offshore MMC converter with various varying fault resistances. That is five ohms, 20 ohms, 50 ohms, and 100 ohms. Then again, DC fault is applied at 30 kilometers down the line with varying fault resistance of five ohms, 20 ohms, 50 ohms, and 100 ohms. Then again, DC fault is applied at 75 kilometers. That is midpoint of the DC cable with varying fault resistances of 5 ohms, 20 ohms, 50 ohms, and 100 ohms. Then again, DC fault is applied at 112.5 kilometers with varying DC fault resistances. That is 5 ohms, 20 ohms, 50 ohms, and 100 ohms. Then lastly, DC fault is applied uh, to the terminal of MMC1, which is the onshore MMC converter, and with varying fault resistance of 5 ohms, 20 ohms, 50 ohms, and 100 ohms. And all these faults are pole to ground faults and pole to pole faults. So, on the onshore MMC converter, right, that is rated at 2000 megawatts. It converts uh, the DC voltage to an AC voltage equivalent and that to achieve a 230 kV AC bus. The 230 kV AC bus is integrated to a transmission level step-up transformer that steps the voltage from 230 kV to 400 kV 
and this um, step up transformer is rated at 780 MVA. On the 400 kV side of uh, the step up transformer, you have uh, a 400 kV transmission line that has two circuits that is double circuits with bundled uh, four conductors that is integrated to three parallel AC grids with a short circuit ratio of three. X to R ratio of 20, frequency of 50 Hz, and voltage of 400 kV. And um, a little bit that to talk about uh, the modeling of uh, the DC cable is a frequency phase uh, dependent uh, model to capture the dynamics of uh, DC faults uh, and also the frequency dependent elements like capacitance and inductance. Next up uh, is a uh, slide is uh, the voltage source uh, converter MMC with a half bridge uh, sub module. Uh, basically, a schematic of it that shows uh, all the uh, different states uh, that we have, switching states we have. So we have uh, four switching um, states. Now, let's talk about the DC fault characteristics. Okay, so for the DC fault characteristics, uh, we have uh, the one for the fault to ground, and the fault to ground, we have two stages. The first um, stage uh, is when the, the pre-wheeling diode and the DC cable is discharging to the faulted point when there is a pole to ground fault. The slight drop in DC voltage on the submodule uh, capacitor is not considered as a state because there's there's not a fully a full discharge or a full drop in DC uh, in the voltage of uh, the submodule capacitor. The next stage uh, is stage two. That is the grid side uh, current feeding stage. That is when if, uh, the DC cable has fully discharged. Then comes uh, the grid side um, uh, feeding stage where the grid um, um, AC fault uh, basically uh, current uh, feeds through uh, the pre-wheeling diode to the faulted point until steady state uh, condition is uh, reached. Next uh, is the pole to pole fault. On the other hand, uh, the pole to pole fault has three stages, right? Okay, so the first stage, the stage one, is the where the uh, capacitor fully discharges, right? Okay, so you have a, a pole to pole fault. So basically, you have a complete shock and the voltage becomes zero. So the capacitor fully discharges and that is considered as stage one. Next is the discharge of uh, the DC cable, right, to the free wheeling diode to the faulted point. So when the DC cable fully discharges, then we move on to state three. That is when the great side of uh, AC grid uh, start feeding its uh, current through the free wheeling diode to the faulted point, and basically uh, the converter becomes an uncontrolled uh, rectifier. Next are the parameters of uh, the 77 level MMC1 and MMC2, right? Okay, so both our uh, MMC converters uh, are rated at 200, 2000 megawatts, and uh, the nominal AC voltage uh, uh, is uh, 230 kV, okay, and the frequency is 50 hertz. And uh, the transformer voltage, basically, you know, remember, you know, we have a converter transformer that basically. Uh, steps up or steps down the voltage uh, to the desired voltage that is required by uh, the converter, right? Okay, so for the MMC, uh, on the onshore, it steps it up from 230 kV to 370 kV. So the converter requires an AC voltage of 370 kV to achieve a plus or minus a 320 kV uh, pole to ground voltage and a pole to pole of 640 kV. Okay, nominal DC current is 3.12 kA. Nominal DC voltage is plus or minus 320 kV and pole to pole 640 kV. The normal salt module in the upper arm is 38 and the lower arm is 38. And that's so a total of 76. So that brings us to a 77 level. So the rest are the passive uh, uh, element uh, uh, parameters uh, they are ready. And the length of uh, the DC cable is 150 kilometers. Now, let's walk through the structured control for the MMC, right? Okay, so for the MMC uh, control, we have the outer controller and the inner controller. 
Okay, so the, uh, for the outer controller, we have uh, this part set points uh, for the DC voltage and the active power that is fed to the upper or the outer level controller, right? So the MMC that is located on the onshore is basically has a grid following control, right? And the MMC that is located on the offshore is basically operating in an island control that is grid forming control. So for the MMC that is located at the onshore, it is base it has basically DC voltage and AC voltage control, right? So it is controlling the direct axis current and the quadrature axis current to maintain the DC voltage and the AC uh, voltage. On the other hand, the dispatch set points uh, of DC voltage and active power sets up the references of the direct axis current and the quadrature axis current that is fed to the inner controller. So for the um, MMC that is located offshore, like I indicated, it's operating in a grid forming control. So it is building its own AC voltage and frequency to mimic that of uh, the AC grid through the phase lock loop utilizing the phase angle um, from the AC grid. So as uh, the, these currents are fed to the lower controllers, basically um, the PI controller, its goal is to determine the error and minimize the, the error and generate the required uh, direct access voltage and quadrature access voltage to the MMC converter. In parallel with that, we, we have a capacitor voltage balancing algorithm and a circulating current suppression algorithm. For the capacitor voltage balancing algorithm, its goal is to maintain the voltages on the sub-module uh, capacitors at the right voltage. And as you know, you have an MMC uh, converter that is in operation, right? You have uh, um, the upper arm and the lower arm, and you have uh, three phases, phase A, phase B, phase C. Due to unbalanced voltages, right, you can have a circulating current uh, that is flowing in between the phases, phase A, phase B, phase C. Also, due to unbalanced voltages, you can have um, circulating current that is uh, flowing between the upper arm and the lower arm. So you have a circulating current suppression algorithm that minimizes uh, these circulation uh, currents. Then you have uh, a pulse width modulation that basically helps us uh, to provide uh, uh, the direct access voltage and the quadrature access voltage to uh, the converter, to regulate uh, the converter. Next, we'll talk about the proposed uh, protection scheme and fault clearing strategy that, uh, uh, we, we, uh, that is part of uh, this uh, research. Okay, so for the initiation of uh, the fault detection and the fault protection criterion, right, I'm utilizing the wavelet coefficients and the wavelet entropy, and that is based on uh, MATLAB uh, uh, discrete wavelet uh, transform algorithm. Okay, so to distinguish between an internal and an external fault, I'm utilizing the polarity of uh, the DC fault current in comparison with the AC side. And also, I'm utilizing machine learning algorithm, the fine decision tree, and fine KNN algorithm in, in addition to that. You know, so that will supplement uh, the polarity um, criteria. For fault classification, and that is a pole to ground and a pole to pole fault, I'll be utilizing the machine learning algorithm. And that is uh, the fine decision tree and the fine uh, KNN. Matter of fact, I'm utilizing uh, three algorithms and I'll find, I'll determine the best one. And in addition to these two is uh, the fine Gaussian support vector machine. Next is uh, the proposed uh, fault clearing strategy. And uh, this is a scheme of uh, uh, the fully selective uh, fault clearing strategy, you know, that is, um, my research model was a point-to-point a, a -point, uh, symmetric multiple configuration, but it's going to evolve into a multi-terminal DC configuration. So that is why 
I'm utilizing the fully selective uh, fault clearing strategy as part of uh, this uh, uh, research. So basically its goal is uh, to define and delineate uh, the zones uh, that are being put, uh, protected, right? Okay, so as you can see this zone, I have a uh, uh, this is circuit breaker on both ends. So that uh, protection zone has been defined, right? Okay, so the goal is to identify the faulted zone and allow the health zones to continue in operation. And the architecture of uh, the fault, uh, the fully selective uh, fault clearing strategy is a hybrid DC circuit breaker and a hybrid soft module MMC converter. As you can see over here, I have a hybrid um, so module MMC converter and a hybrid DC circuit breaker on both line ends of uh, the transmission system. Next is uh, the proposal for detection strategy. And uh, we'll work next slide is uh, basically um, a flowchart that basically tells you how, when uh, for detection uh, starts, right? And uh, when my protection also starts as well. Okay, so I have the start. And I'm measuring my continuously measuring my current and my voltage, right? Okay, and I export it into MATLAB and Simulink or digital signal processing, where I perform discrete wavelet transform decomposition to determine uh, the details of a high frequency wavelet coefficients as an output, right? Okay, then from there I determine the entropy. So I selected um, an eight level uh, decomposition because of uh, to lessen the computational uh, bed, right? Okay, where basically I determine the highest level of uh, wavelet uh, coefficients and the corresponding um, uh, wavelet entropy. So at that point, uh, then I'll determine uh, based on uh, the highest uh, wavelet entropy, I can determine the set point based on uh, the entropy. In addition, I can add uh, some reliability factors like uh, uh, between one to five percent, you know, uh, called uh, a margin as well. So that itself uh, will tell you when protection starts. And if I don't have uh, those values, then basically it goes back, it goes back to measurement of current and voltage. Next is a uh, distinguishing between an internal fault and an external fault. Okay, so. Next is um, a flowchart that basically tells you distinguishing between an internal and an external uh, fault. Okay, so um, as a protection uh, starts and as a reference or, or continuation from the protection uh, scheme from slide uh, 17, I'm utilizing the polarity of uh, the DC current and uh, the AC side current, and uh, also utilizing uh, the wavelength coefficient of uh, the DC fault, and also utilizing my machine learning algorithms, right? Okay, so I've uh, been able to validate uh, the polarity of uh, the DC current and uh, AC current, then also based on the wavelength coefficient and also based on the fault classification, right? Okay, so I declare an internal fault, right? So if I have a yes, then I'll move on to the next stage of uh, determining the fault distance and classification of uh, uh, the fault, uh, either a pole to ground fault or pole to pole fault. On the other hand, uh, if it is a no, then it is an external fault and my DC protection blocks and allows uh, the AC side protection scheme to take care of the fault. Then it goes back and uh, risk, um, cycles back to uh, slide 17 to continue the me measurement of the voltage and the current signals. Next is determination of the fault location, right? And uh, as you can see over here, this is also, you know, continuation uh, from slide 16 and 19. Okay, so after I have uh, determined the onset of our protection, when protection starts, right, I've detected the fault. Then I am able to distinguish between an internal and an external fault. Then I move on to the next stage of uh, determining uh, the distance, right? Okay, so I have to determine the arrival times of uh, the tra problem with and the arrival time is based on the processing from machine learning the time duration and also determination of uh, uh, the uh, wavelet uh, coefficient of uh, uh, the fault signal right? okay so the velocity basically can be calculated right okay so you have a uh, uh, C, which is uh, the traveling speed of our light, right? Okay, 
3 times 10 to the power 8, right, meters per second. Then below that is uh, the inductance and the capacitance of the cable core. So based on that, I can determine the velocity of uh, propagation. Then based on that, I can determine the fault distances. So I can compare the actual fault distances and the calculated dis fault distances and determine the error. Next is a fault classification utilizing machine learning um, algorithm. And uh, okay, so I have my pole to ground and my pole to pole fault data with various uh, varying fault distance, uh, fault uh, resistance. Then I pre-post process it utilizing a machine learning algorithm and uh, transform it into a machine learning format. Uh, you know, because the data is in uh, Excel, you have to pre-process and transform it to a format that will be understandable by the machine learning algorithms. Then from there, basically derive uh, the features, right? Okay, so the features is basically the classification, right? And you classify the different types of faults, right? Then you train the data, right? Utilizing um, all algorithms, but these three basically were the main ones uh, that uh, gave uh, you know promising uh, results. That's, that is uh, the fine decision tree, the fine uh, Gaussian SF SVM, and the fine uh, KNN. Right. Okay. So out of that, uh, the uh, KNN and the fine decision tree were found to be the best uh, classifier algorithm. Right. So from there, then I performed uh, two to five percent of the data. Right. Okay. Uh, perform a testing of the data. Then, based on that, I'm able to classify uh, and authentic, uh, you know, uh, photo ground uh, classification and photo pole classification. Now, let's continue with uh, the port classification and the machine learning algorithm part, right? Like I indicated, there were three main algorithms, right? Okay, so, and uh, that basically gave a uh, promising uh, results. Uh, that is a fine decision tree algorithm, the final. Uh, KNN and the fine Gaussian support vector uh, machine, right? Okay, so there are other definitions, right? True positive, true negative, false negative, false positive, true positive rate, true negative rate, false positive rate, false negative rate, positive predicted values, false discovery rate, right? Okay, so let's take a, a typical example of a, um, a fault classification that I performed, right? Okay, so it was uh, four different faults, right? Uh, and uh, that way, um, pull together, right? Okay, so you have a pull to pull fault at uh, zero kilo kilometers right? and uh, with a fault resistance of 50 ohms. So that was uh, uh, assigned a classification feature of negative one. Then a pull to ground fault at zero kilometers and 50 ohms. And that was assigned a classification of one. And a pull to pull fault at 30 kilometers with a fault resistance of 100 ohms. That was assigned a classification of zero. Then a pole to ground fault at 30 kilometers and fault resistance of 100 ohms. That was assigned a, class, a classification of two. So this is uh, you know the confusion matrix that uh, um, I obtained. You know, so from the uh, confusion matrix, uh, you can see I have a total training sample of uh, 2024, right? Okay, so this is uh, the training accuracy that I obtained. Fine tree gave me a, a training accuracy of 96.5%. And a fine um, kennel nearest neighbor gave me 97.4. And fine Gaussian support vector gave me 96.8%. Okay. So the processing um, speed, the training time are what is shown over here. And the prediction speed are also what is shown over here. So as you can see, looking at the diagonal, so the diagonal element tells me uh, how this um, algorithm was able to predict correctly the actual data, right? The actual data. So as you can see over here, right, 485 elements, it was uh, basically able to predict it. 486 uh, data, 469 data, 484, it was correctly able to uh, predict it correctly. Okay, so percentage-wise, uh, definitely, you know, this is what I, you know, the confusion matrix. Uh, so the confusion matrix uh, basically gives you different uh, 
data visualization. So this is one of uh, the data uh, visualization elements uh, that uh, the completion matrix uh, uh, gives. So next, uh, let's talk about uh, the testing of uh, uh, the sample, right? Okay, so I selected 2%. So that gives me that gave me about 40 samples uh, to test. Okay, so in testing, uh, basically for fine tree, I obtained 90% accuracy, testing accuracy. And fine KNN, about 97.5%. So as you can tell, fine KNN was the one that gave me the best uh, uh, testing accuracy. Right, so that is why I was saying that uh, uh, the best algorithm was is in between fine KNN and fine tree. Next is uh, another typical uh, confusion matrix. Okay, so this time it's between um, a pole to pole and a pole to ground fault at 150 kilometers from the onshore MMC with a fault resistance of zero ohms. And I'm utilizing these three. Um, machine learning algorithm, fine three, fine KNN, and fine Gaussian uh, so, uh, support vector machines. As you can see over here, my training accuracy that I obtained from all three algorithms is 100%. It means that all these algorithms were able to predict 100% accurately, correctly, their actual data. Next up, uh, it's a uh, various uh, visualization charts uh, from the confusion matrix uh, that is uh, that can be shown from the sample that was uh, um, uh, trained. And this time, you know, the training sample is 1,012. For a testing sample for this uh, uh, four classification, right? Okay, so I consider 5% of it. So I basically have a testing sample of 50, right? As you can see over here, uh, the fine tree and the fine canning and the fine Gaussian algorithm were able to predict 100% uh, accurately their actual data. Next up uh, are different uh, visualization checks from, uh, from uh, the machine uh, algorithm. Next, we'll talk about the proposed backup fault protection strategy, right? Okay, so I have a main protection scheme, right? Definitely, I will need a, a backup protection scheme uh, to uh, basically uh, come into place uh, when the main protection scheme fails. So I'm utilizing the AC side uh, circuit breaker as a backup protection. And uh, um, like um, I indicated, uh, this basically AC side uh, circuit breaker usually takes about 20 to 80 milliseconds uh, to basically implement uh, the tripping of uh, the DC um, grid. Next slide is uh, basically utilization of uh, the AC side uh, circuit breaker of the MFC as a backup protection for the failure of a hybrid uh, DC circuit breaker. Okay, so as you can see over here, continuation of protection. If I have an internal fault uh, that is uh, declared, right? Okay, then I'm gonna have a time delay uh, for the protection element of uh, the hybrid DC circuit breaker, right? Then after that, uh, it's gonna issue a trip signal to trip uh, the DC circuit breaker, right? Okay, so if the DC circuit breaker is able to clear the fault, if basically it works as it's supposed to, then basically I have a yes, then it I have an end, then basically it goes back to the cycle to uh, the sampling of our voltage and the current uh, and measurements. On the other hand, if I have a no, then there's going to be a time delay, right? Then after that, uh, it's going to issue a, a command to the AC side breaker to trip. Then after that, uh, if the AC side circuit breaker uh, trips, then basically it clears the fault, then it returns to steady state operation, then the cycle. Um, begins by sampling of our voltage and the current uh, signals. Next, we'll talk about feature extraction and detailed uh, coefficients and entropy.
Okay, so in processing the fault signal, right? Uh, okay, um, there is a mark, uh, lab code that um, I utilize that to perform uh, multi level uh, wavelet uh, transform decomposition. And uh, I utilize uh, the sliding window approach uh, to extract uh, the coefficient. Okay, so uh, this is uh, just a, um, a portion of uh, the MATLAB code, right? Okay, to get MS uh, uh, features, right? Okay, where X is uh, basically the columns of uh, signals uh, that is uh, that is that comp comprises of uh, signals and uh, rows and columns, right? Okay, so the wind size is uh, basically the window size, and uh, that basically I utilize uh, 32 samples, and uh, I utilize uh, 32 samples. Uh, uh, basically to test uh, the window after the fault uh, um, extraction in feature extraction then next is the uh, increment okay so after you know basically after you have uh, the initial window size of 32 then you have an increment of uh, 16 samples okay and uh, basically I have I utilize the sample frequency range of uh, 20 kilohertz 200 kilohertz so I varied the uh, and the sampling frequency from 20 kilohertz all the way up to 100 kilohertz to basically uh, identify and make sure that at 20 kilohertz will I be able to accurately uh, capture the features and be able to process the signal right so because a lower sampling frequency basically translates into lower cost so let's take for instance I have 100 kilohertz uh, sampling frequency so the Nyquist uh, uh, highest frequency of concern is uh, 100 over 2, 50 kilohertz, right? Okay, so the first level of decomposition, the second level of decomposition, the third level of decomposition, the fourth level, basically that uh, tells me the low pass filter frequency range and the high pass filter frequency range. So this is a typical feature extraction for a pole to ground fault at 30 kilometers with a, a zero um, uh, fault resistance. Okay, so right on top here, it's your, it's my PS card uh, uh, simulation fault from the DC fault current, right? Okay, so like I indicated, I'm utilizing a window size of 32 as for my code, right? But after I extract uh, uh, the uh, features, I'm able to determine that I can uh, the features it basically it's between 204 samples to 209, so five samples different. So my 32 samples is adequate for that. I, can, I could have even utilized 16 uh, with, uh, samples as the window size. Next is uh, another um, uh, basically feature, feature extraction and that shows a comparison where basically I varied uh, the sampling frequency from 20 kilohertz through 100 kilohertz, utilized on different um, uh, matter wavelets, uh, that is uh, the RPGs and simulates. You know, and uh, basically, I obtained uh, basically the, the same thing, feature and uh, destruction, as compared to the original signal. Okay, so this slide uh, tells me uh, the maximum and the minimum detailed wavelength coefficients for various uh, uh, fault uh, locations, right? Okay, so as you can see over here, just like uh, you in uh, the AC side, you have uh, basically maximum level of fault, minimum level of fault, where based on uh, uh, you're able to set the protective relay a little bit above uh, the minimum level of fault by adding some margins into it the same thing applies here i have my maximum detailed wavelength coefficients and the minimum detailed coefficients where i'm going to utilize that to set the protective relay next is uh, uh, basically uh, entropy features right like, uh, based on uh, eight level of decomposition remember i made mention that I selected uh, eight levels to reduce uh, to uh, the computational burden, right? And uh, because uh, larger computational burden, this means that uh, larger cost, right? And also slower protective release speed. And you don't want that. You want uh, a faster protective release speed. So I selected um, only eight level decomposition. So similarly, you know, uh, for entropy, I have uh, the maximum and the minimum. So I'm going to utilize the combination of uh, the entropy and the wavelet uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, coefficients uh, to set the protective relay. Next, uh, set the simulation results, right? Okay, uh, for my model, right? Okay, so uh, this section uh, tells me all the steady state uh, simulation results that I 
obtained and uh, as you can see over here look at all these uh, plots right and the times and the and peak uh, uh, currents that were measured basically that basically is what I'm supposed to have so I've been able to validate the steady state operation of my model the same thing applies on this uh, um, slide that is uh, I've been able to validate uh, my steady state operation of my model so this section also shows that MMC um, uh, DC link um, measurements and all that I'm supposed to have as per design okay so this uh, slide tells me of all my steady state results what I'm supposed to have uh, to validate uh, my model and uh, below that uh, basically tells you uh, the processes uh, that is uh, involved in energization of uh, MMC one converter and an MMC two converter. Next is uh, basically uh, justifying why we need the DC breakers. Okay, so this one I'm utilizing uh, the AC side circuit breaker to clear the fault to justify why uh, that longer time that is uh, displayed uh, by the AC side circuit breaker will be a jeopardy to the uh, DC uh, network. You know because of the longer clearing. Uh, time that is uh, exhibited by this AC side circuit breaker okay so as you can see over here you know um, um basically it's taking about 40 to 50 milliseconds uh, to clear the fall and that is a long time you know for especially you know with uh with um, uh, a dc um uh, grade uh multi-terminal dc grade uh, basically you know you, you are required uh, to clear the fall faster than that so that itself uh, justify uh, the reason why we need a faster floor uh, for clearing um, um, breaker okay so this slide that shows us all the uh, DC current okay so I have uh, the DC current on, on uh, terminal one and uh, the DC current on uh, terminal two then the total DC current right okay so it shows uh, uh, the clearing of uh, the DC four and uh, the duration right okay so that uh, justifies uh, the need uh, for a DC circuit breaker to clear the fault faster than AC size circuit breaker. Okay, so this uh, section shows us uh, the DC fault uh, simulations that uh, uh, I uh, utilize uh, for uh, my research. And uh, this uh, basically tells me the positive fault to ground fault at zero kilometers and uh, with a zero ohms fault resistance. Okay, so all these simulations were, was what I performed for various sections of the length of the DC cables and basically collected uh, uh, the data in an Excel format and uh, basically uh, screened uh, the data to in a form to be processed in MATLAB. Similarly, for this uh, slide, these are all the simulation uh, plots and charts that um, I had uh, for all the various uh, simulations that I have performed. The same thing applies here for various uh, faults, and uh, this tells me uh, the DC link uh, um, the voltages that I obtain. So, this slide that tells me a table, it gives me, a, you know, basically it's, it's a table, right, that tabulates all the data, all the parameters that I, I obtain for performing simulation for a pole to ground fault. So, as you can see on the uh, first column, right, I have a pole to ground fault at zero kilometers with various varying fault resistance that is zero ohms five ohms 20 ohms 50 ohms 100 ohms and i have all the data that is required right i have uh, the dc4 current the dc pole to pole voltage the dc pole to pole voltage on uh, terminal two this one on terminal one the mmc1 the uh, rms uh, current uh, voltage mmc2 rms voltage mmc1 rms current mmc to RMS current, right? So these are all the data. Everything is in, in, you know, tabulated nicely, and uh, basically you can go through that. And if you have any questions, you can. Okay. Next is a continuation of uh, the data of all the simulations, uh, uh, DC fault uh, simulations that uh, I performed. Next is a continuation of uh, the data. Okay, so. This is uh, the data for port to ground fault with various uh, um, fault uh, varying resistance. So I have uh, another data uh, for port to port fault with various uh, fault uh, varying uh, uh, resistances at various uh, uh, fault locations. Okay, 
But for the sake of time, you know, I think uh, I don't have uh, that table as part of this. So I just showed you uh, what I have uh, for Portugal uh, for. Next uh, is uh, identification of a uh, lightning disturbance. Okay, so as you know, uh, the onshore MMC is located in an air insulated substation. Right, okay, so um, once it is located there, it's going to be prone to lightning and switching disturbance, right? Okay, so uh, lightning disturbance, uh, where do we get it from? Okay, and uh, that is, uh, you know, basically sometimes uh, studies are performed before the substation is built to determine the amount of uh, lightning, historical lightning uh, disturbance. So um, there's also something they call um, background operating noise, right? Okay, so background operating noise, uh, sometimes we can uh, get it from, if you have an industrial facility that's located in proximity to where the substation, uh, onshore substation is located, right? Okay, so that background noise can corrupt the uh, signals uh, that uh, the protector really is seeing. Okay, so uh, simulation uh, has to be done for that to identify that. And also, uh, you can have a lightning disturbance that can basically corrupt a, uh, a steady state uh, signal and not uh, cause uh, any fault. And you can have a lightning disturbance that can actually cause a fault. So there has to be a way of identifying and distinguishing that. Okay, so what I'm doing is uh, basically I'm utilizing the high frequency component uh, energy that is entropy of uh, the high frequency and uh, the energy of uh, the low frequency component after processing this uh, in um, entropy, that is the Shannon entropy, and determine the ratios to distinguish between a lightning fault and non-lightning fault. So next is a flow chart, right? Okay, so this is a flow chart that I will utilize uh, to uh, perform that distribution uh, criteria. And continuation of uh, the flow charts. Okay, so I may mention that uh, during, um, you know, um, even if you have a three phase fault, right? Okay, you can have a, a background noise uh, corruption, right? Okay, so the background co noise corruption can come from an industrial facility that is located in close uh, proximity to the substation. Uh, or you can have a substation, a noise that is coming from the substation itself, right, due to electromagnetic uh, interference, right? Okay, so I corrupted a three phase four signal with Gaussian noise based on different level of noise. That is 5 dB, 10 dB, 20 dB, 30 dB, 40 dB, 50 dB, 60 dB. So this basically is background noise uh, corruption. When a three-phase fault should occur on the onshore uh, converter. Okay. So this is uh, the corrupt, corrupted signal, as you can see over here, right? For 5 dB, 10 dB, 15 dB, 20 dB, 30 dB, 40 dB, right? And this is the original signal, right? Okay. Next, the corrupted signal for 50 dB and 60 dB. Next is the denoised, the ability to remove an algorithm. There should be an algorithm that is going to remove this um, noise uh, signal so that it, you can see it uh, with a uh, comparable with the original signal. Right? Okay. So this is the denoised uh, signal, as you can see over here. Then okay. denoised uh, signal. Next is a steady state, right? Okay, so during steady state operation, right, you can have a, a corruption of uh, these uh, steady state operated, op operated signals coming from the substation itself uh, due to electromagnetic interference. And also if you have an industrial facility that is in close proximity, or if you have a construction going on in close proximity to this substation, right? Okay, so, um, this uh, signal uh, itself uh, shows uh, how these uh, uh, noisy signals are obtained from a steady state. So I have corrupted uh, the steady state um, uh, signals with 
this Gaussian noise that is 5 dB, 10 dB, 15 dB, 20 dB, 30 dB, 40 dB, 50 dB, 60 dB. And this is what I have obtained. Next is 30 dB, 40 dB, 50 dB, 60 dB. Okay, next, how do we remove and extract denoise this signal? You know, we basically developed an algorithm to be able to denoise the, this uh, signal, right? Uh, to mimic uh, the original steady state operation so that uh, they really wouldn't think it is a fault condition. Okay, so this is uh, the denoising capability of uh, the algorithm. So, so next is uh, lightning disturbance. Remember, I may mention that uh, um, I need to calculate uh, uh, and determine the ratio between the high frequency component and the low frequency to be able to set the relay to be able to distinct, distinguish between a lightning disturbance that will cause a fault or a lightning disturbance that will, will not uh, cause a fault. So this is a um, work that is ongoing, is in progress, right? Okay. So next is uh, performance val validation. Okay, so as part of the performance validation, I built a, a sequencing, sequencing uh, network and also a breaker uh, logic scheme in uh, PSK. Okay, so um, that work itself is uh, in work in progress. I'm, hope, I'm hoping to uh, finalize it uh, because, you know, I have to basically update some of uh, the timing based on uh, after I have processed, uh, you know, I've completed a, uh, a processing uh, the, the fault uh, uh, signals uh, performing for classification and also um, determining the time of arrival of uh, the travel away. So I will need uh, all these times to um, input it back as part of my sequencing and update my sequencing, then basically run all the simulation. So that work itself is uh, ongoing. I'm hoping to finish it uh, by the end of uh, uh, this month. So next is uh, a chart, you know, a sequencing chart that shows you the how I built uh, uh, that sequencing. Okay, so start my sequence, then wait uh, wait for the time to apply the fault. Okay, so I'm waiting so 20 seconds to apply the fault. Then once I apply for the fault, I wait uh, for the protective uh, relay, um, delay for the protective relay that operates a, a DC breaker one and two. Okay, so currently I have a 0 0.03 seconds, but like I said, all this time duration will be updated. Right, okay, so this one is just a tentative time that I have over here. Then I send a signal to open uh, uh, DC circuit breaker one at this time. Then after that, I wait for 0 0.0 second, one second. Then I open uh, DC circuit breaker two. Then I wait uh, um, um, I wait for, based on this uh, protection relay, for the AC side circuit breaker, uh, 0.02 seconds. Then I open AC side circuit breaker one. Then wait for another 0 0.01 seconds, then I'll open AC side circuit breaker two, right? After that, I remove the fault, I clear the fault, right? Okay. Then I wait for uh, 0.24 seconds, right? Okay, to re-energize uh, uh, the uh, DC uh, grid or uh, configuration or my DC uh, network. Okay, so I close a uh, breaker this is a side circuit breaker at uh, this time, right? Okay, then wait for another 0.1 seconds, right? Then I close uh, um, I close uh, a DC side um, circuit breaker, um, no, AC side circuit breaker two, right? Okay, then I wait for another 0.1 seconds, then I close uh, uh, DC side circuit breaker one, then I wait for another 0.1 seconds, then I close uh, DC side circuit breaker uh, two. Okay, this should be correct. Uh, two, two. Then, uh, basically, I've been able to re-energize uh, my DC uh, network. Okay, so the last slide uh, basically uh, tells you know shows you my AC breaker controls, the timing that I utilize. All this, like I indicated, you know, I will uh, update it, you know, based on uh, my fault classification algorithm. Uh, time that I obtain for processing all this, uh, especially the test data and uh, the training data and uh, the timing, I'll utilize that to update it. And also, um, 
processing of uh, the wavelength coefficient to determine uh, the time of arrival of uh, the traveling wave. So I'll update all these uh, timings that is in this uh, uh, DC breaker controls. And uh, also, you know, I think that this is where my uh, logics, so the logics that I uh, designed for this, uh, uh, this uh, controls. With that uh, comes to the end of my presentation. And uh, like I indicated, uh, I know that uh, this presentation is very long. Um, it's uh, quite close to about an hour. But during the actual presentation, uh, um, I think I'm, I'm allowed only 25 minutes. So I'll skip some of the slides uh, during the actual presentation, you know. But you can always go back, you know, on this uh, pre-recorded uh, video uh, to always watch it and uh, basically un understand and uh, basically uh, uh, listen to uh, every presentation on each slide. You know. So basically, this uh, pre-recorded, I'll say that this pre-recorded uh, video allows you to uh, watch uh, presentations that are very long and uh, also to listen to everything that is on each slide. Okay, with that, that uh, comes to the end of my presentation. And thank you so much uh, for your listening. Yes, and if you have any questions, I don't hesitate. Uh, you have my email address, then uh, you can always uh, contact me, send me a question, and I'll uh, get back with you as soon as uh, I can. Thank you so much.